Hello, I am Jungle Jim, Jungle Jim at your service. Welcome back to the Jungle Jim Bible Story Series. I'm so glad that you've decided to watch this video today, or, well, maybe someone's forcing you to watch it, probably at gunpoint, but that's, a, you know, that's okay. Hopefully uh, this will be so enjoyable they'll just uh, put the gun away. Uh, yeah. So anyway, I recently received a letter from a Mr. Alpha A. Bet, who asked me, Jungle Jim, how did you get interested in the study of theology? Now, at this point, I have to make a slight correction, because, you see, I, I'm not actually interested in the study of theology. Theology means the study of God. Were I to be interested in the study of theology, that would mean I was interested in the study of the study of God, which is not theology, it's theology, which in turn would make me a theologian. But I never aspire to be a theologian because, it, well, it's just too low an occupation for me. <laughs> you see what I did there? It's a too low. low, low. <laughs> okay, so it wasn't that funny. Uh, all right. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll try again next time. But... I have uh, come from a long line of theologians, as it were. Uh, in fact, there were 267 of us in line at the Mount Everest University graduation. Ooh, and that doesn't count in C, uh, Oxford Middle School, uh, Charlie's Chocolate Factory. And oh, yes, I come from several long lines of theologians. Uh, also, I have quite the family history of theologians. All began with my great great grandpappy, Mountain Mike, followed by my great grandfather, Desert Dan, my beloved grandpappy, Beach Bum, and then, of course, dear old dad, Roy. Now, dad wasn't actually the theologian in our family. That, that title belonged to, to mom, but he, he was a very keen mind, a great woman when he saw her and was ahead of his time. He was one of the very first uh, men to marry a valley girl, a valley vic. And she was like a totally awesome mother, like thereof. And so, yes, she was actually the theologian of our family. But that's, you know, that's neither here nor there. You see, with such uh, a great family history of theologians that I was naturally drawn to the subject. Well, now, let's uh, jump into our story for today, shall we? When last we left off, we talked about Abraham, Sarah, and Isaac. Remember, Abraham was a hundred years old. Sarah, ninety years old, when they gave birth to Isaac. He was the child of promise. He was the child through which many descendants were supposed to come because Abraham had been promised by God he would have as many descendants as the stars in the sky or the sand on the seashore and that his descendants would inherit the land of Canaan, the land comprising the eastern border, the Mediterranean Sea, basically thereof. And uh, what else? Oh, the most important promise of all, that through his seed, meaning through one of his descendants, all nations on earth would be blessed. A prophecy of Jesus, the Son of God who was born uh, via Mary, a descendant of Abraham and Isaac. So, when uh, Rebecca, uh, excuse me, as you see here, uh, she's going to come up in the story. So don't panic if you don't know who she is. We'll get to her in a minute. When Isaac was around 40 years old, by that time his mother had been deceased for about three years. And Abraham decided that he, he should get a wife for his son. Now you may be thinking, 40 years old, that's a long time to wait to get someone a wife. Well, you know, you have to remember, Abraham actually started thinking about this when he was, oh, about 125. But back then, you know, he was thinking, well, let's see, there's something I need to get my son. What, what is it? What is it? And then about 15 years later, boom, all right, hit him. Oh, yes, I need to get him a wife. 
It just, you know, things work a little bit slower when you're that old. So he called in his most trusted servant, greatest of all his servants, chief of servants, calls him in, says, I want you to put your hand under my thigh and swear to me that you will not get a wife for my son Isaac among the women of Canaan where I live, but you will go to my father's relatives, my father's household, and find a wife for my son Isaac there. Now here's a couple of things to explain. Uh, one is the uh, awkward statement to put your hand under my thigh. Well, you know, you know we have uh, cross cross my heart and hope to die, they had stick your hand under my thigh. But uh, there is an explanation for this. When, some, when you're asking someone to make a very serious oath, you would say, put your hand under my thigh. And, and the reason for that is once the person was through saying the oath, he would say, thigh will be done. And you see, now it makes perfect sense. So yes, it was a very serious oath. And so as a, a symbolic uh, gesture, he put his hand under Abraham's thigh and said the oath. But the other thing to see is, is that, and, and you see here, the stories I'm telling you are coming from Genesis chapter 24 and 25. The, the Genesis being the very first book of the Bible. And I put here some of the, the things that will the themes, shall we say, most important themes of today's stories. And this one at the bottom is the one that we'll deal with just now. Because Abraham was sending his servant, not just out into the front yard, across the street, to the neighbor to get a wife for son Isaac. That would have been easier, logistically speaking. But the women of Canaan didn't worship the Most High the Most High God. They worshipped all these other gods, but they were not the kind of women among which, you know, Abraham wanted a wife to be chosen for his son. But he knew he could find a godly wife if he sent his servant to his father's relatives, a woman who was a follower of the Lord God, creator of heaven and earth. And so it was extremely important to Abraham that his son have a godly wife. So he sends his servant. The servant gets ten camels together, articles of, uh, of gold and silver, you know, uh, some treasures and trinkets, some, some great gifts, and he sets out on the journey. And after, a, you know, what was no doubt, a very, a very long journey, he finally arrives to the village where his, his master's relatives lived. He gets to a well of water, has the camels kneel down it, and he starts to pray. And he says, Lord God of my master Abraham, please give me success today. Show kindness to my master Abraham. Behold, the daughters of the, the men of the city are coming out to draw water. Now let it be that the young woman to whom I say, please let down your pitcher that I may drink. And she says, drink, and I will also give your camels a drink. Let her be the one whom you have chosen for your servant Isaac. And by this, I know that you have shown I will know that you have shown kindness to my master. Now, I love this for many reasons. One is the servant is, is humble. God loves humility, hates pride. You see, he could have been arrogant. He could have said, oh, I know what a good, I know a good wife and I see one. I'll just sit here by the well and just grab the, you know, the one I see that I think is best. But no, he appealed to God for help. In fact, in his prayer, he asked for a sign. 
Uh, no, 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 not like, you know, where's the bathroom kind of sign. You know, back then, you know, the, the, basically the world was your bathroom. Uh, there's places like this on the earth still today. But we don't want to get into those stories, let me tell you. But yes, now the, the sign he was wanting, he was wanting God to manipulate the situation in such a way that would communicate, this is the one that I have chosen for Isaac. And so he asked for a sign. And, and I, I like what he did here because, for one, he was very specific. Uh, he said, um, let it be that the young woman, young woman. You see, the servant knew God has a sense of humor. Uh, you know, our laughter, you know, that's a quality of God that he's bestowed upon us. And so you've got to watch out. He didn't want to give God that much leeway, lest he come back with somebody's great-grandmother to be Isaac's wife. So he was specific, young woman. The other thing I like about this is the sign he asked for was a test of the heart. Would a woman give a stranger a drink? And not just the stranger, voluntarily. Barely, on her own accord, without even being asked, also give ten camels a drink. Now, I've never had a camel for a pet. Had the old pooch. Got two of them even today. They're not hard to, to give drink to. You know, they're, when they're thirsty, you fill up a small bowl and boom, you're done. Camels aren't that small. Now, I've never given one something to drink, but I know it, it can't be as, you know, here, it has this little bowl. It's got to be a little more difficult than that. And this man had ten of them. So the next statement we see is, is a beautiful statement. It says that, behold, before he had finished speaking, that Rebekah was born to Bethuel, the son of Milcah, the wife of Nahor, Abraham's brother, came out with her pitcher on her shoulder. You see, before the man had even said the amen, shall we say, he was still praying. Rebekah came out. Now, if you didn't catch, you know, she was the, the daughter of who, the son of who, the, what, the, what, the where, uh, Simply put, Rebecca was Isaac's first cousin once removed. Which brings me to a completely different point that has absolutely nothing to do with the Bible story. But since, you know, it, it just, uh, uh, the time is apropos to tell you this. Because many people have asked me, saying, uh, Jungle Jim, you and that Mr. David Hicks look a lot alike. Why is that? Well, we actually do happen to be related. Uh, Mr. Hicks is my first cousin once removed and then put back. It can't win them all, as they say. But, but yes, we were related and, and thus the similarities. So now, where were we? Oh yes, back at the well. So the servant goes up to Rebecca. And says, uh, uh, please, would you give me a drink? And so she lets down her pitcher, gives him a drink, and now nothing so far has been said about the camels. But the Bible says as soon as he finished drinking, Rebecca said, hey, hey I will give your camels a drink as well. <gasps> what? You do what? And, and the very first woman he came to, Rebecca, here she is giving water to a stranger, someone she's never met before. And now she's going to the well. Picture down, picture up, give to camel one. Picture down, picture up, give to camel two. Ten camels. And the servant, he's just watching all this. Is she really going to do this? You know, maybe she'll give two or three a drink. Say, ah, you know, well, uh, I'm tired now. I'm going back to the house. No, she did the whole thing. And the servant was overjoyed. He runs up to her, gives her bracelets of silver, uh, gives her a, a ring of gold. Okay, so it was a nose ring. And, and I, I must say that I really don't recommend 
going up to someone you've never met before and cramming a ring up the nose. But, you know, if it's made of solid gold, probably they don't mind. I, I don't think I would mind if it was, you know, solid gold. They come to think of it, but, you know, I still don't recommend it as a first meeting technique. But, yes, he gave her a, a nose ring of gold. And so he explains why he'd come. And so Rebecca, you know, she runs back, gets her mother, her brother. Apparently her father was deceased at this time, may have been traveling. But uh, more likely he, he was already deceased. But no matter, she comes, uh, her brother comes, uh, and, and he's so excited. So they welcome him to their house. And this servant was so dedicated, even after such a long trip, would not eat a thing would not, you know, would not eat, drink. He had to explain why he was there. And so he tells them the whole story about Abraham and, and uh, how he was his servant and then how he had prayed for a sign and Rebecca was the answer. She was the sign or, or the painting on the sign or, or, or the post that held the sign up. I don't know. You know what I meant, but you, she was, yes, the answer to the prayer that God answered even before he had stopped speaking. That's amazing. And so they asked Rebecca, well, do you, do you want to go be this man's wife? And Rebecca said, yes. So Isaac and Rebecca were married and Isaac was comforted concerning the death of his mother, Sarah. Now, years passed, and Isaac and Rebecca had no children, which was rather odd because, you know, again, he was the child of promise, and Abraham and Isaac, they were supposed to have descendants too numerous to count as, well, not immediately, okay, as time progressed. So Isaac prayed to the Lord, and apparently he prayed twice because Rebecca became pregnant with twins. Uh, fortunately, he didn't pray about the matter five or six times. And you think, oh, goody, twins, oh, they're so loving, they, they care for each other so great, and they get along so well, and okay, let's, let's, let's hold back for just a moment here. Uh, first of all, these were not identical twins. They were about as identical as a cat and a dog. And if you, asked, if you had the opportunity to ask Rebecca, she'd tell you that's about what it was like having them in her womb. They were picking and poking and prodding and punching and, and, and wrestling. And poor old Rebecca thought she was giving birth to the WWE. And she said, why is this happening to me? They were so desperate. They, they went to a, a prophet, a seer, a person of the Lord. And, and they asked. And they asked. And, and, you know, it doesn't say this in the Bible, but I'm about to explain to you that it is very obvious that they went to a man. This will be, every woman watching this video will understand immediately how we know it was a man that they went to see. Because they asked the seer, what, what they explained the situation, asked what is going on, and then the, the prophet, the seer, gave the word for the Lord. He said, two nations are in your womb. Oh boy. Uh, okay, men, let, let me just explain it to you, okay? If you ever see a woman who is pregnant, please do not go up to her and tell her there's a nation in her womb. They're rather sensitive about these matters. 
Oh, poor old Rebecca. She said, what two nations are in my womb? What do you are? I know I'm pregnant, but I'm trying to keep my girlish figure. I can't believe you'd say something like that. And poor old Isaac, he's just trying to calm her down. No, 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 no. Please understand. He's not, this is not literal here. It's being metaphoric, symbolic. Please calm down. And so finally, okay. All right. Yes, yes. I'll, I'll listen. Sorry, you know. The hormones, it, it, it's driving me crazy. So, yes, yes, uh, after everyone had calmed down, he goes on to explain, two nations are in your womb, two peoples will be separated from one another, and the older shall serve the younger. Now, that's an odd statement to make. The older will serve the younger. We're talking about twins. Well, yes, for us, that's very odd. You don't normally have an older and a younger unless one's born at 11.55 p.m. and the other one's born at 12.05 a.m. We, If they're born on the same day, we don't consider one to be older than the other. But not so in their culture. The first one born was considered the older, and especially if the first one born was the absolute first child of the woman. Well, that's the firstborn child, the firstborn son. He would inherit uh, the birthright. He would be given the birthright, meaning, uh, among other things, for example, that he would inherit twice as much as his younger siblings. And so Rebecca gives birth first to Esau. Now, the Bible says that he came out and he was red and hairy all over. Which makes you wonder, well, why didn't they name him Harry instead of Esau? Well, I do have an answer for this. You see, most likely Isaac was there. And Isaac, well, he saw that he was Harry. And so they named him Esau. They, they just think differently. They're in a different culture. And also, when Esau was born... The Bible tells us that Jacob was still holding on to his heel. He was still wrestling. And so they named him Jacob, which wasn't the, the kindest of names. It kind of means deceiver, trickster, something to that effect. And so there you have it, twins, Jacob and Esau, with Esau being considered the older and Jacob the younger. Now, I'm looking right there to see how much time we have. Okay, I'll tell you one more. I'll, I'll put a little in at the end of this story. And we'll continue next time from there. As they grew up, Esau became, no surprise here, a hunter. I, I mean, he, when he was born, it said he was red and, and hairy like a garment. The boy, from the time he was born, was a walking bottle of testosterone. One of the first babies ever to learn to shave before he learned to walk. And so he became a hunter. And we loved it to go and kill and cook wild game. And, Jake, and Isaac, ooh, he loved Esau's cooking. So Esau was Isaac's favorite. Jacob was the homebody. Apparently, he had given all his testosterone to Esau, or Esau had taken it in the womb or something. He just liked sticking around in the tents. He liked to cook. He liked, you know, he was a homebody. And he was Rebecca's favorite. Now, that will come into play next time. I'll leave you with this story. So one day, Esau had been out hunting for a long time, didn't catch a thing, didn't kill a thing, came back to, his, to the tents and he was famished, felt like he was starving, felt like he was about to die. Now Jacob was cooking some red stew. And so Esau comes up to Jacob and says, oh, please give me some of that red stew. I, I'm famished. I'm about to die here. And Jacob being the loving younger brother that he was, said, 
Oh, really? Hmm. How convenient. Tell you what, you sell me your birthright, and I will give you some red stew. And Esau replied, well, what good is a birthright to me But if I'm going to die? Please give me some stew. And Jacob said, oh, you bet. you swear, you make, an, you make an oath here that you are selling your birthright to me. And so Esau swore the oath. And Jacob gave him some red stew. Uh, and incidentally, and, and Esau ate it. He gave up his birthright for the red stew. And so he also earned the name Edom, which means red. It also means Edom for selling his birthright for some stew. So yes, that's what he did. And that wasn't the only time that those two ran into one another and did some disagreeable things. But we will pick up there next time. Thank you for listening. This has been Jungle Jim. Jungle Jim at your service. I'm still trying to be at your service. <laughs>